Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Barry Kostrinsky, president of the Artists Talk on Art, the ATOA. Um, ATOA has been around since 1975, hosting talks in the Lower West Side of New York City in different locations. Uh, today, for the last year and maybe uh, two or three months, we've had to go virtual, and this will be our 62nd virtual talk, consecutive Mondays, um, that we've done this. Uh, tonight, we have four presenters. We are a 501c3. Our talks are free. If you'd like to contribute, all our information is on our web, atoanyc.org. Our calendar of future events is there as well, and also our past talks. If you'd like to do a talk, be a part of a talk, come up with a panel, reach out to me. You'll see the information on the web, and uh, we do our programming that way and have more information coming out shortly about our programming committee, which I'll discuss at a later uh, Monday talk. So we have four presenters. We're gonna have Barbara Friedman, Zan Medina, Patrick Martinez, and Tony Silver Delarive. Did I get that right, Tony? Well, she'll, she'll say it correctly later. I couldn't hear you, Tony. Muted. Delarive, Tony Silver Delarive. Delarive. Wish me luck. I'll get it right 50%. Don't worry minutes. about it. Okay. It's my husband that would be upset. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank you all for sharing your time, sharing your thoughts. Our format is jump in at any time you like and go ahead, uh, give us your thoughts, ask a question, make a statement. We tend to give very positive responses and really have grown into a community that mutually supports each other, shares ideas, um, and opens up new thoughts for artists. So thank you all for doing that, sort of being regular or new to our group. So we'll start off with uh, Barbara Freeman. Barbara, welcome. Um, I let the artists introduce themselves. Uh, makes my job easy. So Barbara, tell us a little bit about yourself. I am looking for you on the screen. There you are. Uh, hi. Um, so I'm Barbara Friedman. Um, I'm a painter and um, I guess I've been a painter, you know, pretty much all my life. I've also, um, I'm a professor of art at Pace University and I've, I've been there embarrassingly, but luckily I guess for, you know, like around 35 years, I, I, uh, I stepped into the job right out of grad school. And, um, you know, it's, I, I, I do enjoy teaching a lot as well, um, but I'm always, you know, uh, crazily looking for time to, to just be in the studio. Um, and uh, I live and work in the financial district. Um, and uh, I, I don't, I don't know. I have, I have two, two daughters. Um, my husband is a, a philosophy professor at uh, City College and the CUNY Grad Center. And so we're, we're both, we're lucky to both have um, summers off. And um, he's, his family is from, um, or his father's, both his parents are Greek. His father's from a, uh, a little village on the island of Samos, which is a, an island off the coast of Turkey. And the village is, is you know, quite, um, it's, it's a really modest village and people have very little there. And um, we, he inherited his family house and we, we go there in the summer and um, that that sort of plays into my work too, as you'll see. So um, I think I'm going to share my screen, Barry. I'm just going to. I I taught on Zoom all year, so I, I hopefully I you know I kind of put it out of my mind immediately when the semester was over because I'm I'm going to be face to face next semester, I assume. But um, I think I remember it, so I'm just going to click share screen, and uh, hopefully. Um, let's see. Here we go. Okay. Um, I'm going to go play from, does everybody see just That's the it. slide? That's it? Okay, cool. Excellent. So hopefully we're good. Um, I've decided last summer, um, you know, I did, you know, I, I 
I, I do present my work, you know, at different venues, whatever, whatever, but the, you know, fairly regularly, but the last one I did really focused on, I, I decided to focus on process, on my process, which, you know, um, it's not that unusual or anything, but it is, it, it does determine, my process really plays a huge part in determining my content, which isn't always the case for a, a figurative painter. So I guess that's what's slightly somewhat unusual about it. And I thought, and I was talking to stu that, that that particular um, talk was aimed at students. So I thought it might be interesting to, you know, just to discuss how the paintings were made, how they came to be. Um, so um, I'm only, I'm gonna focus on work, I guess for the last 10 years or so, that's it. I'm not gonna go back far because it's just, there's too much work. And my work does change quite a bit. Um, anyway, this is just a very quick installation shot of a three person show I was in the last show before the lockdown and it, it, it opened um, very appropriately on leap day on February 29th. Um, and the show was called hauntings so it all kind of came and then you know and then we were locked down a few days later, but um, that's so, so it's three people um, Jillian McDonald who's a, a video artist um, and you don't see another kind of wonderful um, Filipino American artist named Marigold Santos um, and myself and the paintings back here are my are mine. Um, and here are some more paintings. This kind of maybe will give you a sense of scale. It's always hard with paintings to really feel their scale. Here are Marigold's drawings. Um, all right, so these are some small ones. I, I um, in the last, I don't know, maybe seven years or so, six years, um, my, I, I, I've been, I, I guess my elevator pitch as such would be that I make um, painterly figurative painter, paintings of um, unreliable narrators uh, yep. that are, you know, maybe, I don't know, they're, they're usually in, um, they're usually somewhat unsettling, both narratively and formally, but usually, but the, but these narrators, these, these protagonists often just emerge from my process, you know, from formal concerns, and then they just are added to my arsenal of characters. So, you know, this is, um, this is called a little prick. So it's Pinocchio and this is actually, I and mean, I'll talk about this a little, that's just a detail from Constantine's foot, this huge foot in Rome. Um, this is just called yellow toy. Uh, one thing that's interesting about, you know, I can kind of talk about a little bit, say in this painting, again, this is an installation shot, but the red in the feet, the, the red that the, um, feet are made of and that sort of come through in the striped pants. This is a pretty big painting. It's seven foot long, um, is the underpainting. And something that I started doing about now, about 15, 20 years ago, um, is starting with a really vivid underpainting and then painting an image over it and eradicating the image basically, you know, just kind of brushing over it and seeing what shards of underpainting came through and then either the image would change totally depending on what came through you know sometimes that negative space would become the positive space or whatever but that was kind of my starting point and i i think i always need something to um subvert what i'm doing to kind of mediate it you know to as a mediator to kind of mess it up um maybe you know in school for a nanosecond i was a printmaking major so that that might have something to do with that that need. Um, you know, my work is called from, you know, all kinds of sources or I'm, I'm inspired by art history, pop culture, you know, all kinds of memories, um, etc. And uh, this is an example of, of uh, a piece that was inspired by a very large Renaissance St. Sebastian that I saw in Milan, um, in which, uh, you know, the, the saint, I mean, I'll talk about it in a second, was, um, you know, flanked on both sides by these little um, women in balconies, 
that I saw as kind of a juror and they were at crotch level. Um, so anyway, so that's here I took St. Sebastian's loincloth off, but I'll, I'll kind of lead you through this a bit. This is still that show. Okay, here's a St. Sebastian. And I focused on this detail. I was mesmerized by them. Um, and that's so, so, you know, I can find my protagonist from anywhere. Um, so this is the area that I, I loved um, from that painting. And then I did, you know, they, they just sort of entered my arsenals. I, uh, arsenal, I did, I did many paintings of these women. Um, you know, and again, I like, I do tend to paint things in and out. So I had a lot of things happening here. You know, Pinocchio's nose was coming up, you know, phallically and this and that and the other. And, you know, I had a Gumby masturbating over here. different things happening. And, but it was much, I found it that it was more powerful when I took, I took it all out and they were, um, you know, chatting amongst themselves, but we don't know what about. Um, here is a painting you know, of them and the St. Sebastian disrobed. Um, but in terms of my process, uh, this is an old painting. It's like a, I don't know, painting I did about 12, 13 years ago. It's heavily encrusted of a castle in the air when I was doing these paintings of lost places. And I, I needed a, a large canvas and I guess I no longer was interested in the painting and I do this quite often. I pulled it out um, and I knew I was having the show at five miles and I wanted, I, I needed some big work, you know, and I just, I don't know, I just, I pulled it out and um, decided to paint over it. Um, so I had been painting this, these women, this jury. So I thought it would be, I don't know what would happen if I use this painting as kind of a backdrop. So, um, here I have the women and this guy is hanging off, trying to get in this intruder, you know, and I, I guess they're trying to decide whether to help him up or not, or there's all that. Um, and here's the painting finished, um, you know, and that's sort of how I develop it. And then here are some quick examples of other paintings where there's a Pinocchio and the women, this is called Clinging to the Truth another one. Um, Gumby's also a protagonist that, you know, that I used. And I'll, I'll show you how Gumby came to be. But it's another clinging to the wall. And these aren't the same women. These are actually, um, these women were inspired by uh, Pontormo's visitation, which visited the Frick recently. And it was, I don't know, it's really an incredible painting. So they're sort of loosely from that. And Gumby's eavesdropping. Here is just a, some of the objects that I look at because, you know, I, I see my paintings as kind of uh, touching on still life, landscape, portraiture, you know, it's, it's informed by all these genres. Okay. Um, one thing I wanted to mention briefly, this was a little side journey, but uh, I guess in 2012 or so, um, for a year or two, I painted in museums because I'd always been fascinated by the, the idea of the Sunday painter, the hobbyist that copied paintings in museums. It was something that, you know, I was in art school in the late seventies and that was so totally uncool and like a, would, you know, like a really ridiculous thing to do. So I was kind of just curious what that would feel like. Though I had no intention of literally copying paintings. I just wondered what it would feel like to paint from them, you know, to actually be in their presence. So I got a copyist permit and painted on site in the Brooklyn Museum, at the Met, at the Hispanic Society, you know, all over the area, the metropolitan area. And um, this is a picture that somebody took when I wasn't aware of it. It kind of, it circulated a bit on Facebook because it looked like I was super close to that Rembrandt, much closer than I was. It was kind of weird. And I had this huge brush, but in fact, the Rembrandt was under glass, you know. But anyway, just to kind of show you, here is the piece I was painting. And what I would do is I, you know, I would paint the painting, something a very, very quick um, impression of the painting. And then I would eradicate it, which, it's kind of how I was painting anyway. 
and just see what I could pull out. I, I felt like I was making a portrait of the model. It's not so much that I was painting. I was thinking about, you know, whether it was a Franz Hals or a Velasquez or a Rembrandt or whatever, or Goya. It was more about painting this person that was long dead and like they were sitting for me again. I, I found that sort of haunt, haunted, you know, like, I don't know, spectral. And so this is a friend. Also, that you know, I had and I set rules for myself. These were done in museums. You know, there were usually two sessions, and then I became friends with, you know, the the guy the guy who worked downstairs at the Brooklyn Museum. You know, where you could uh, store your coats and stuff. He would let me leave my painting stuff there, which I really wasn't supposed to do. But that helped because then I could come back a few days later and continue. Um. I was painting a lot of uh, paintings of Dutch old master paintings in the Brooklyn Museum, and many of them sported these big rough collars that intrigued me. Um, and they were, you know, because they were both, to me, they were a stand in for the body, and they also were all about class, which was, you know, which I didn't know. The bigger the cuff, the more aristocratic you were. So it was this weird, you know, I mean, it addressed gender and class issues and all this stuff. And um, it also gave me something to think about painting when I was at home because all my painting was being done on site. And so when I was in the studio, I would kind of kind of make up the head and this, the cuff would just get bigger and the rough, excuse me, would get bigger and bigger and um, become more fantastical. And it, assumed a life of its own. Some of these are very big paintings. And it could become almost a UFO. So here it has become a UFO. And then, again, in terms of process, I would, at a certain point, I started pulling out old paintings that I wasn't interested in and threw a rough in. So this is sort of before, after. You know, before after oops sorry so that is something that i i do do i find myself okay um and then to, again to, to to try to um illuminate where my main characters come from this is um a collapsed roof our neighbor's collapsed roof in the village in greece that we go to and um there are many collapsed roofs in the village and that to me, first of all, formally, it kind of reminded me of the collar for some reason, but also, you know, a collapsed roof seemed to be, you know, suggest displacement. I mean, Samos is one of the islands that many of the refugees have gone to. So obviously that's incredibly tragic. The islanders are also, you know, very poor. And so it's, it's you know, um, anyway, so this roof um, entered my my vocabulary and i saw a gumby the central tiles to me suggested a splay legged figure so first i painted this roof you know without it's a, it's a lousy slide but you get the idea and it's not holding anything up it's kind of free floating you can see the uh, background color in between the tiles and then after you know the painting was finished i kind of saw this figure on it so it's the same painting i mean it kind of went from this to this. And then, the, so then I started, after that, I started just painting gumbies because I went out and bought some gumbies. And I don't know, that's sort of how it came to be in my painting. All right, I do, wanna, I do wanna read a comment or two. Uh, Olga Alexander says the color palette is amazing. And I love the narrative that can conjure up almost uh, like Kondo, uh, I think George Kondo and his figures. Um, and certainly, yeah, your color palette is, uh, it, it is interesting. It's both soft, harmonious, beautiful, and yet strong. And you're really pushing edges. You seem to be a pure painter, but you love playing with both the past, whether it's a past artwork you did, and then injecting an odd, unique image from another era. So it's like a surreal combination that I think helps your work. Um, uh, I like how you're engaging the past and, uh, you know, in uh, art history as well, of course. Very nice. Well, thank you. 
Uh, we have about figure five more minutes. Okay. I'll, you know what? Maybe should I just run? I'll run through them because yeah, a little bit I, faster. I, right. Exactly. Run I'll go the, much faster. You know, because I I tend to be sort of an image person, so I am. I'm going to run through. You kind of get the idea of my process, and then I want to quickly show what I'm doing, which is quite different. So here I talked about the collars. This I want to like very quickly. Okay. So here's what I do with a lot of paintings. This is. Um, you know, one of the one of the callers and went out to a show, came back, didn't like it. So here's what I did to it. Um, so I turned it into an umbrella, right? I was doing the roofs at the time. Didn't, you know, like I turned, you know, so the same background you can see. Then that became, oops, okay. So then what happened was I didn't like the umbrella either. So then I decided to, I don't know, I ended up using the innards of the umbrella to make this figure. So the inside of the umbrella became this Gulliver because I painted the negative space around it. I didn't touch the umbrella. I just painted out the stuff under it, or around it and added this head. And what happened was it went from being something that flew overhead, you know, to this huge Gulliver like presence that had fallen to earth. And I, I kind of, the houses became Lilliputian. They became tiny as opposed to, you know, literally small because it's a big figure. Anyway, so after that point, I started thinking about Gullivers as these just intrusion into landscapes. So the Pinocchios and Gumbies and whatever became sort of Gullivers. Yeah, this is, these are just examples of my process of what paintings become. You know, you get, I mean, it's just, Okay, so here's the sort of Gulliver Gumby in a landscape. Here, you know, the Gumby is turning into spilling out, and you know, uh, there's a rainbow because Homer said rainbows were bad luck. <laughs> anyway, this this was inspired by a Goya painting. That's why I threw it in there. This is an old school bus painting that I changed into this Pinocchio, which I'm thinking of felled lumber, can't see the forest for the woods, kind of. Um, Okay. And then, you know, the village gets swallowed by sharks. You've seen, this gives you a sense of scale. Okay, here's another painting, starts out this, this is a huge painting, shadow on this little town, shadow becomes a pig, then the town swallows the pig. This is all the same painting. This was pretty, re this was at, right at the beginning of lockdown. This one, sort of a Gulliver's legs and this becomes this. And again, you have a sense of seal. All right, very quickly, here's what I'm doing now. This is all, this was one time, but it informed what I'm doing. This was the, the blue was the underpainting, which I just throw on, it's just terpy paint, see what, you know, and then I cover it with an image. But in this case, and then, you know, little pieces are made. In this case, I really like the way it had dried. And I never just used the underpainting. And so I inserted this little incident, this, my mother, who was Swiss, you know, I just died. So it became this little weird chalet thing. And, you know, Barbara, you create a great landscape by working with that slow color change you get and the bleed. Um, well, that's what I'm doing we, now. Are we looking at oils? What material? Oh, I'm sorry. This is all oil. All oil. This is I all, wanna, I should have said that. That's okay. I want to read a comment. Tony uh, Silva Bellarive says, I like the whimsical nature of the work. It certainly has that. Um, and Wendy Bliss, I like your sense of freedom to continually let the paintings change and evolve. Um, and you definitely are. You are definitely, you. Uh, you, you're going with the flow. And even if out of sort of destruction, you see creation in the negative, you pull up to the positive. But there is a, a very playful sense in your work. Um, I'll open it up to a question. Wait, let me just, I, I'll okay. just. Sure, Can I just so then this is the same thing 10 years later where I like the way the underpainting dried. So this was supposed to have a totally different painting on it. This is just terpy or you know, a loser and orange paint. And instead of painting it like I normally would, I just added these four pieces of blue and the nose and the mouth. And you know, I see that I, I see this as you know, Pinocchio having sex with himself or so I, you know, some weird, but so then I tried to kind of um not to, to do paintings where I have no preconceived imagery and I let things just come out of the way the paint dries, which is what I've been doing. 
And that's kind of different because it's, anyway, I'll show you quickly. Here's some watercolors where I tried it first just on watercolor. And all I did, all I did here was put the mouth in. Everything else was just, you know, just, it just dried that way. And here I did very little, these are watercolors. And then I'll tell you when they become paintings and then I'm finished. This I did a little more work on. This was, you know, again, I'm just sort of, I have no idea what it's gonna be. This I did a little more work on, it's called Pass the Duck. These are oil, the same technique in oil paint. These are large oil paintings where I just kind of put the paint down. Like all I did here was I did paint the snake in the eye and that's it. On this painting, this is a very large painting. All I did was add the eyes. This is just the way it dried. So this is painted quite differently. So these are just these strange creatures that I let sort of come out of these paintings and that's it. Sorry, I just wanted to, okay. That's okay. Let me uh, stop screen <laughs> sharing. Thank you, Barbara. Let's see if I have unmute. Thank you, Barbara. Very nice. Um, obviously you can't unpack a lifetime or nor 10 years in 15 minutes, but uh, we got your sense. And I, I think, you know, you're dead on in the process when you get those drips from, uh, you, I don't know if you're using uh, what thinner, but you get a fascinating, almost like root-like pattern that comes out. And it's quite beautiful. There are some artists in art history that use that to their advantage and create this very surreal, odd tone and mixed with your beautiful colors really is nice. Um, I do wanna, I'll read a few comments. Um, uh, Audrey Anastasi says, process marries illusion. Very nice, nice way to say it. Eloisa Pomfret, love your usage of color. And I've always noticed artists, um, their sense of color is like a part of their soul. Everybody has their own palette and it evolves, but it doesn't necessarily evolve too far. I mean, you know, check your art and how it was or is. You'd be surprised. And, you know, sometimes we do so many different materials, different materials get different palettes too. Um, Let's see. I do want to move on now, though. Okay, Barbara. So thank you again. And thank you. Yeah. And Barbara, you came in from, you were in New York City, yes? Yes. So now we'll go a few miles away to Zan Medina. Zan. Um, and I, I do want to say um, thank you, everybody. Thank you for being patient. Zan, um, is, his language is Spanish. And we have Veronica Pena, who actually had to leave. So she's probably not here to help. We practice, but Zan, we are gonna do this. And if you at any point you feel you need to go into Spanish, go into Spanish, um, just because, uh, you know, and uh, I, it was a pleasure to meet you. Tell us where you're coming in from Zan. And uh, you do have a diverse range of work and things you do. You pick and choose whatever you like to share um, and welcome again to the ATLA. Um. Thank you, Barry. Um, hello, uh, my name is uh, Chan Medina. Um, I was born in uh, Spain, in Andalusia, and uh, Doñana. And Doñana is a way land. Um, it is a very hard to live, but wonderful to grow, you know. Um, I have a video, you know, for you see my land. Um, okay. It's, okay. May take a minute or two. Thanks for being patient. Yeah, because my world, I speak of the pain of emotion. I think that it's you. Uh, Dan, uh, I'm sorry, I pronounced yeah. your name wrong. It's not showing up. I think he needs to uh, um, stop screen sharing and then put it up on his computer. Veronica, can you translate? Sí. Yes. Uh, San, lo que tienes que hacer primero es cierra el screen share y le das y abres el video. Hazle doble clic al video y luego vuelves a compartir. No, so I'll no. stop the screen sharing. I could do that. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Bobby. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no, that's okay. good. Now open, tell him to open it. Thank you, Veronica. Oh, oh. you're welcome. Ahora? Here you, see, ahora sí, son. Vale. Here we go. Mucho bueno. <laughs> <laughs> son, lo que no tiene ahora es sonido. Ahora? Oh, sorry. Ah, ¿sabes lo que tienes que hacer, San? En la esquina de arriba donde pone View Options. ¿Ahora? Sí, ahora sí. Pero muy bajito. Now my world speak of the pain of emotion. I see there is beauty in that time. I work where nobody wants to love that my theory. For me, uh, this land is really important. I blocked it, you know, here in Islam. My father, my mother. I've seen, um, okay, um, I need the uh, artist. You know, I paint. Uh, this is my painting. You know, I'm um, my technique is this um, is the ink and bleach. You know, I like uh, um, 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 I like a uh, song. Uh, Pain the animal, the dog is a proof, no representation then. That uh, to look for that, lost the innocent of the human being, you know. And I see the key, uh, what we lost, and that we like the pain then. Um, sorry, uh, but it's impossible for me. Uh, what is okay? Sorry, but uh, I have problem. You, sí. want, you know what? I'll stop screen sharing. Tell the same thing. Sean, lo que tienes que hacer es abrir las imágenes en algún programa. No sé si tienes preview. No. No. Y si haces doble clic a una imagen, cómo te la abre? Me la abre así solamente. No me la puedo abrir de otra manera. Vale, es que nosotros lo que vemos son todos los slides pequeñitos. Muy pequeñitos. Sí, todo pequeñito. Por, no. Es porque está en, un, en el... Estoy en... No, no tengo otro programa para abrirlo. ¿No? ¿Qué, no. ¿qué programa estás utilizando ahora? Uh, el escritorio, el que tengo de ordenador. Sí. Y es que no tengo otro... Es que me... So what we'll do is stop the screen sharing hmm. and let him open up just one image and then we'll do it again. We'll just do that a few sí. times. Trata, trata de abrir una y compartir solo una, a ver qué hace. Ahora sí. ¿Lo ves bien? Esta sí. Eh, se ve una imagen. ¿Pero la ves grande o la ves pequeña? No, la veo bien. Está ocupando toda la pantalla. Vale. Si, si la cierro y vuelvo a poner, es, I'm sorry, you know, but, uh, sí. ahora, no. No sé si puedes abrir varias a la vez, si abres varias a la vez, te, te va a dejar ir pasando de una a otra. Vale. O sea, primero tienes que abrirlas y luego compartir. I do want to thank everyone for being patient again. This is ATOA Artist Talk on Art. We do this every Monday. We have some exciting news coming shortly about 
uh, possibly going back and starting up our season no, ahora vemos el conjunto de todas, Sam. Sorry, Barry. That's okay. Try open up a different image. Let him open the image first. Sí. Not, not this. You yeah. Know. yeah. Sam, lo que vamos a hacer es ir de una en una. Vale. Primero abres, o sea, primero abres, compartes y luego vuelves a cerrar. O si quieres me las mandas y las comparto yo desde mi ordenador. ¿Cómo te las mandas? Por email, no sé, como tú quieras. Madre mía, perdona, lo siento mucho. No, no pasa nada. Ah, no sé cómo mandar esto. Uh, let me. So, Sam, I, I stopped I stop the screen sharing. Uh, sí. You know, you know what we'll do? We'll, uh, let me open up to some thoughts and questions. Because that we can certainly do. Sam, tell us uh, some of the things you did when you were younger. Were you an artist? Were you involved? Did you draw a lot? And Veronica as well, ask a question. Let's open up some of Zan's thoughts. And feel free to respond in Spanish. And Veronica, you can translate. Sure. Um, mm, before we go to that, Barry, let me ask him something. Because uh, I just really want for the image to be seen. San, si le haces doble clic a una imagen sí. antes de compartir la pantalla, te abre esa imagen, que es lo que has hecho la primera vez, ¿no? Sí. Vale, y ahora no, no le has hecho doble clic a la imagen. No, espera un momento. Eh, ahora sí. Uh, can I make a suggestion? Oh, no. He's got to open the images first before he starts sharing. He yeah, that's what sharing. I am telling him. But okay. All okay. right. Sam, deja de compartir el screen share. Vale, abre una imagen, solo una. Um, don't screen share yet. Yeah. Don't screen share. Y una vez que la has abierto, compártela. Oh, la edad. Okay. Yeah. Well, that is. Yes. Vale. Um, Tienes que hacer eso con todas, o sea, dejar de compartir, abrir la imagen, volver a compartir. Vale. Vale. What living me live, waiting to make me love the beauty of the lines of drawing. I want the time to feel with my looking it, you know. And for me, it's really important uh, uh, um, the message on the to uh, Japanese culture, um, Spain culture, you know, because. Uh, it's, it's the same thing, you know, and uh, oh, sorry. Sí, primero tienes que abrir la imagen, Sam. I stopped it for Tengo problemas con esto, porque no me deja. No te deja, eh. Ahora. No, no, se, se ven las pequeñas. Sorry, Barry. No, let me see if I can punch you up on your Instagram. Instagram, Zen. Veronica. Zen, ¿tienes Instagram? Uh, tengo Facebook. ¿O tu página web o algo que podamos ver? Facebook. ¿Facebook? Yeah. Um, Barry, he has Facebook. They have going on it. Thanks for everybody. Maybe I can I can go to his face. Are you on Facebook, Barry? I've got a website, Veronica. I asked him but he said Facebook. Yeah, but you can't share from Facebook. Yeah? You can, but the images aren't usually like they are on Instagram. That's true. Yeah. All you get is a feed. 
no se puede ver nada. No you ves nada. Do it how you want. Um, Oh. Yeah. Se no, ve sí. muy, muy pequeño. San, estoy tratando de ir a tu Facebook. Pero va a ser un poco raro para compartir. ¿Por qué? Bueno, no sé. O, o si, si, voy a tu face, si voy a tu Facebook, les enseño lo que tienes en el Face. Son muy pesadas tus oh, imágenes, sí. San. Vale, en fotos. Porque si no me las puedes mandar, si son... Es que, ¿cómo te las sí. mando? Mira, Barbie está poniendo tu Facebook. Si le ah, quieres decir dónde claro, ir... Pero claro, este es mi muro, no es... Ya. Yeah. <risa> ya. Yeah. Espera un momento, a ver si te lo puedo. Pero es que si te, no te lo puedo mandar por, por, por mail, porque es un wi ¿Can you go to his photo page? There you go. His photos or his albums. Oh. Es que Mira. Tienes que, no, tienes que ir a, a, a fotos. Sí. ¿Tú, ¿Quién lo está manejando el Facebook? Barry. Ya, pues dile que tiene que ir a fotos. Yeah, he's on photos, I think. That's But, right. Yeah. You are on photos, right, Barry? Yes. Yeah, yeah he's on photos. Es que hay, en el Facebook hay un poco de todo. Yo no tengo página web. Yeah. Um, es que al final me ha descontrolado todo lo que quería decir. San, Barry te pregunta, por ejemplo, dónde has aprendido a dibujar así. Uh, oh, y él, no. él, él dice que has hablado de, de la cultura japonesa como una influencia. Yeah, because I, uh, I, I, uh, autodidacta, no sé cómo se dice autodidacta. Uh, he's a self-taught artist. You know, I, uh, I am, para, tú me traduces, Verónica, por favor, porque se me ha ido todo lo que quería decir. Tranquilo, yo te traduzco. Vale. Um, para mí fue interesante viajar a Japón y... y y encontrarme con, con un artista de Dan Sabuto. For him, he was very interesting to travel to Japan and to meet with a Buto artist. Bueno, ahí speaking, cuando hablo con, cuando empecé a hablar con él, me di cuenta de que, de que la Dan Sabuto tenía, uh, nació cuando las bombas de Hiroshima y Nagasaki. When Shan started to talk with the Buto artist, he realizes that Buto dance uh, was connected to the bombs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah, When he realized of the importance of the Buto dance, he needed to paint it and he worked on it. That, wa that was the, the, the theme of, of some of his, paint, of his, of his paintings, drawings. Um, you know, maybe what we can do, if you go to view options on the top of the screen, there is a, you know, it allows you to have different sizes, like it allows you to do 300%. Maybe if people want to click on 300, you can see the image a little bit bigger, but still it's very blurry. Sorry, San, I'm just trying, I, perdona, San, I'm just trying, solo estoy tratando de ayudar, <laughs> porque quiero que no. vean tus imágenes. Um, ¿Ahora ves esta imagen? Mm, no. Wow. Mm, 
esta imagen la ves ahora. The image, the image of the face in the corner. Do me a favor, Veronica. We're going to wrap it up and move forward. But uh, yeah. go ahead and uh, ask him what's he working on now and what's coming next. Uh, Sen, um, dice que es, es mejor que, en, que lo dejemos aquí, pero quieren saber en qué estás trabajando ahora y qué es lo próximo que vas a hacer. Uh, lo próximo que voy a hacer es una exposición sobre uh, la matanza de Pol Pot en, en, en Camboya en 1970. Dice que es un proyecto de project is related to the crimes of Paul, how do you say it? Paul Pot? Paul Pot. Paul in, Cole, Camboya. in Camboya. In the 1970s, the exposition se llama The Killing Fields. In the 1970s. And the exhibition is going to be called The Killing Fields. It will be an exposition between pintura, installation, photography, documental. It is an exhibition of painting, um, photography, installation, document, documental photography, documentary photography. Very nice, very nice. Any reference to uh, a, a punk music in that title, The Killing Fields, or, you know, are we talking about, uh, well, Cambodia, The Killing Fields, it sort of says it all. Um, Thank you. Sorry we had problems, but I do appreciate it. Sorry, Barry. I no, hey, sorry. we don't have a universal translator just yet. Veronica, you pitched in and thank you. And, uh, Gracias, Veronica. Lo siento. No, de nada. No pasa nada, San. You know, these things happen. So, no te preocupes. And Veronica, <laughs> if you could type in a link to his Facebook or something or pop sure. it in. I am going to move forward. We have two more presenters. Uh, Patrick Martinez. Uh, Welcome to Artist Talk on Art. Um, we do this every Monday. I just want to remind everybody, um, we will have some exciting news coming soon about going back in person, maybe in our- There's uh, still something up on the screen. At 12 West 12. Very good, I will uh, stop. Thank you for that, Tony. Uh, and uh, we'll go ahead. Patrick, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're coming in from and uh, Look forward to seeing your art, Patrick. Okay, I hope it will work. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Barry, for inviting me. And thank you to all the participants. Um, in order for you to understand uh, how I work and some of the notions that I've been uh, developing in my work for uh, the past uh, 30 years, uh, time flies. Um, I would like to tell you a, a bit about my, my uh, background. And, uh, and take a step back also to tell you a little bit about uh, a couple of anecdotes about my uh, family history. Uh, my, uh, some of my ancestors, as you see in my name, uh, they were born in, in Spain uh, and they actually emigrated to uh, North Africa uh, in Algeria in the hope of a better life. Uh, and. Uh, my, my father was born in, in Algeria uh, uh, in 1940, and he actually became French in North Africa because uh, Algeria was at the time a French colony. So uh, I was interested in, the, in that, uh, in that uh, twist, um, irony of, uh, of, uh, of the history. Uh, 20 years later, he had to move uh, when the Algeria become, became independent. He had to move to France, uh, which he didn't know anything about. So he was already French. Uh, he acquired the, the, the citizenship there and he moved to, to France uh, where he didn't know uh, that country. So I was born in, in France and uh, I grew up there. I was uh, raised there. Uh, and then I started to, uh, I studied at the fine arts school in, uh, in Besançon, uh, a small town, and then Grenoble. And then uh, at the Institute of High Studies in Visual Arts in, in Paris. Uh, subsequently, I started to uh, travel also uh, 25 years ago and first uh, moved to Japan uh, for uh, where I stayed for two years and a half. 
And uh, that's another irony is that it's where I actually uh, started to learn English. Um, and, uh, and then I moved to New York in uh, 1999, where I settled and I've been uh, ever since. I also became an American citizen in uh, 2009. So the, uh, what's interesting to me is that actually telling you about a little bit about my personal history is that things happen in very contorted uh, and twisted ways and sometimes ironic ways. Uh, so we're influenced by circumstances that uh, we, we don't have control over. And uh, the, the fact that I'm the result of this uh, cultural hybridation uh, has actually informed my work in the sense that uh, my work has never had a fixed form and is very eclectic. Uh, so uh, I do drawings, I do sculptures, installation, sound art, uh, video, uh, product design. And uh, uh, my work is in a perpetual evolution and, uh, and actually resists uh, categorization. Uh, and it, it mirrors a little bit my, uh, my um, geographical uh, history and uh, mobility. Um, so uh, in my work, uh, I do not have specific subject matters, uh, but I observe the resurgence of ideas in my practice, uh, they, they keep coming back and uh, such as the notions of movement, displacement, uh, shifts of perspective, process. And uh, I also have a strong interest uh, for optical and light phenomena. And actually everything that question or uh, challenges uh, uh, perception. Uh, other um, things that resonate with uh, my work and that uh, I'm building upon include the notions of void, vacuity, emptiness, absence, uh, or the correlated terms as a, like a saturation, uh, fullness. Uh, I also base my work a lot on the error, failure, experimentation, uh, exhaustion, uh, and uh, but um, and I'm going to guide you actually keeping that in mind, I'm going to try to keep, uh, guide you through uh, some of my works so you, you better uh, see what I'm uh, talking about. Uh, and so we're going to go back and forth in time. Uh, so I'm going to try to share the screen now. And uh, OK. Okay, can you see? Um, Excellent. Okay, very good. So I'm going to start with the with this work, uh, which uh, is an old work from 1992. Uh, it's called Pom Pom, and it's a pompon in French. Uh, and uh, so this uh, in this series of work that I'm showing you right now, it's uh, uh, a very much about process, repetition, uh, rule-based works. Uh, whose uh, main subject is actually to render visible the process of uh, art making itself. Uh, so when I did this, and I'm going to show you another uh, image where you see a 30 years uh, younger version of me <laughs> underneath, uh, is uh, uh, a, a huge pompon that I did by, I don't know if you, any of you know how, you, how to make a pompon, but basically what happens is you see at the bottom, there's a, a, like a donut shape. And that's what you do. You just turn around. Usually you do it with a cardboard shape and you turn around that cardboard shape over and over again until the, it's, the, the center is completely full. Then you cut around and, and tighten everything with a, with, a, with a thread. So I did this, uh, uh, so I made it as, culture and not knowing exactly uh, what would be the color distribution or anything. It was a quantitative uh, work just made by uh, accumulation of, uh, it was made by ways of accumulation, uh, repeating the same gesture over and over again. Uh, so I'm showing another work 
that is about also uh, the repetition and like a kind of rule-based work. And uh, when I started to draw again, because I, I always loved to draw, and actually uh, when I was five years old, that's when I knew that there was fundamental, something fundamental about drawing, and that's something that I would want to do all my life. Uh, and, uh, but uh, when I started again in 1996 to draw, I didn't know exactly what to draw, and I decided to draw uh, the representation of no image on a TV screen. So it's called the snow. Uh, uh, and uh, so it's what's known as uh, electronic noise uh, on a TV uh, on a TV screen. Um, so this work is is as much in relation in relation with abstraction as uh, it is with the uh, representation. Uh, Patrick, Patrick, let me ask you a question. You know, with this work, you know, you you, you have it. it I, I've got to ask, what's your you know philosophical basis behind? It seems like. I mean, what are your favorite philosophers or am I off course? Are there, you know, are, are some of the things you're talking about being interested in process, repetition, accumulation? I mean, are we, are you influenced by, would you say, Foucault? Uh, no, is this something that uh, is not at all based in philo philosophy and strictly process of creation? Uh, well, actually, there's one person who's a, a, a philosopher and a writer, and I would say this is Albert Camus. Uh, this is um, uh, actually, uh, uh, and also because he has a personal relationship to North Africa, and uh, to uh, so it it resonates with me because this is also the story of uh, the history of my of my father and of my 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 family. Uh, and actually, the way he deals with the, the uh, absurdity of uh, of uh, life, and uh, so is kind of existentialism is something that uh, resonates very strongly uh, with me. Uh, in, for example, the myth of uh, Sisyphe, uh, the myth of Sisyphe is actually uh, is a, is an essay about about um, about suicide, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's what's very interesting is is that uh, he, he basically says that uh, of, although life is absurd, is is not leading anywhere. Uh, you've got to carry on, you know, basically, and find some uh, uh, irony and uh, and and this to to keep going. Uh, so, and also, you know, I, I really love his his, his novels. Um, so about the, the, this, this work, uh, I'm going to show you a few different examples uh, also where I'm actually experimenting different uh, gestures. Um, so it's just repetitive and, uh, and, uh, and the fact that it represents also uh, no image uh, is, uh, is just the pretext for uh, uh, putting uh, uh, um, to presenting just something whose main subject is actually the process itself. Um, Patrick, can I ask one question? Yes. What, mater what material is this? Oh, this is a, a ballpoint uh, on paper. Oh, ballpoint. Oh, okay. Yes. So and uh, I like to use ballpoint because uh, uh, actually this is what you use uh, usually for writing. So it's about taking notes. Uh, and uh, I like the immediacy uh, of, of this. Um, so I'm gonna show you uh, something else here. Okay, so this is a different work. Uh, these are digital images. Um, and this is from uh, 2003. This is called Scan X. Uh, and uh, these images are actually uh, uh, about, they represent the complete dematerialization of the fabrication process. Uh, the, way, the way they were obtained is actually by operating a, a, a scanner, uh, uh, an, an empty scanner by opening and closing the cover of an empty scanner uh, at different speed while scanning. And so you obtain these uh, strange images. Uh, this is also about uh, emptiness somehow. I'm scanning nothing. 
so that's what you see here. But you see uh, the um, the white, which looks like light, a light phenomenon, is actually the reflection of the cover itself. So uh, the 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 white is when the the scan is actually obstructed, and what is black is oh. when it reveals yeah, the space it. around it. No, it's fine. I'll I'll leave me. I mean. Um, so I'm going to show you, yeah, so I've, I've done several, uh, several experiments uh, with this uh, technique of scanning nothing, uh, basically, and what I liked also is that everything is digital in here, except the uh, manually operating the scanner itself. Um, So here we have another work, which is uh, called VRAC in French. Uh, so the translation would be bulk. Uh, it's uh, the first work is quite large. It's five feet by seven feet. Um, and uh, this is the first work I did when I arrived in, uh, in New York. And uh, this is a time uh, actually uh, that was the beginning of the internet somehow actually uh, I didn't have a computer back uh, back then, and uh, I remember actually what uh, that finding images or selecting images was uh, a whole process. Uh, you didn't have access to images like this, and so this work is also about a process, but in a, in a different way, uh, and. Um, it's also about error uh, and uh, uh, using interstitial spaces and uh, negative space. Um, so, from uh, uh, what, what I did, the, the idea was actually to fill to fill the entire surface with tiny vignettes, uh, small drawings, uh, and uh, so for, I like the idea that from a distance it's almost look uh, abstract, uh, and you have to move close to start uh, seeing what is going on. Uh, in that sense, it encourages the direct confrontation with the viewer, um, which is also something that is, uh, interests me. Uh, so you could see it as a, some kind of a mapping of my, uh, of my brain and the way it works. Uh, side by side, you will find automatic repetitive drawings, uh, intuitive drawings, drawings by imagination drawing based on uh, photographs, drawing inspired by the shape of the negative space between a uh, few drawings, failed drawings also uh, that are then transformed into si satisfying uh, anomalies or like successful monsters, uh, as I like to call them. And uh, uh, I had a lot of fun <laughs> doing this, but it's also uh, a very tedious uh, work. It took me six months to complete. I'm, I'm sh gonna show you a few close-ups of uh, this work. Um, so- uh, Patrick, I will say it's interesting how it's a little bit like Barbara's approach, um, but of course she's much more on the minimal side, but she yes. does have the positive negative play and she does have that small micro bleed that she gets from uh, what mixes with her oils, but You've got a lot of drawing in here. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say, Patrick, speed it up. We have a few more minutes and we'll move oh, on. Okay. We'll okay. 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 Uh, so I'm going to show you some details. Patrick, can I just ask you something about this piece? I'm sorry. You're saying this is all hand drawn? Uh, yes. Yes. That's pretty incredible. And it's all, it's all ink. It's all ink, uh, and the fact that I, I like the I like to use uh, ink because there's uh, you cannot make mistakes. Right, so exactly. Do. So you have to deal with it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and actually, that's what I'm talking about. When you see, for example, here in the screen, you have like this cow. You see the cow? Yeah. For example, here it's a headless cow, and that exemplifies what I was trying to do. I made a mistake. I completely missed the head. It was ugly, <laughs> so I just made it disappear in the dark. And a lot of this process is is about failure and how you overcome failure to make somehow something that is. Uh, that is going to work, you know. Uh, so this is also uh, a work. Uh, this one is part of a series called The Ends, and where I was exhausting the tool that I was uh, making uh, uh, mark making with, 
uh, for this one, I used the entire content of, of, con content of a ballpoint uh, pen. And I, I stopped when I finished uh, the, the, the pen. Uh, this one is also part of the ends and it's made with a, with a marker. Uh, and you, I'm going to show you a detail. For this one, uh, you see the scraps at the bottom of, the, of this. This is actually the, when the, felt, the marker started to, the plastic uh, case of the marker started to wear out. Uh, and uh, I used every, uh, all of it until there was just a butt. Uh, and I just included this, the scraps of the, the marker into the frame. Uh, this is called bombing, and uh, for this one, I, uh, I emptied the spray, uh, the, the entire content of a, of a spray can onto one point of the wall. Uh, I, love, I love your work. You know, you've, you know, you've got a smart conceptual behind it. You are coming out of process, and you're yeah. getting a variety of form. You know, you're you know, very smart. You know, I, I do draw, and when the pen runs out, you know how to use it. You get these beautiful soft tones where you're pushing really hard, but you're getting very little. So there is, uh, that, that is smart. I almost want to see the pens exhibited alongside the drawings, you know, as a little something. I will read a comment. Uh, uh, Alyssa Pritzker says, excellent drawings. Bab Rheingold, those ballpoint pen drawings are beautiful. I think everybody agree. Very nice work. I do have to move forward, Patrick. You want to run oh. through quickly a few slides, run through them quickly. Uh, okay. In reference to our final presenter. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to try. So these are some details. Uh, this is another drawing about repetition. Uh, this one about just uh, different mountain tops. Uh, I, I wanted to show you all my work about the installation and so, but we won't have time. Uh, just to guide you through the, the, the installation work. Uh, I'm, I just uh, want to, to, to say that I'm often staging the, the relationship between the artwork, the viewer, and within a specific time and, uh, and, uh, and space uh, frame. Uh, so for me, the, subject, the main subject is also the confrontation with the viewer. I'm going to show you this uh, in a minute. This is a, um, uh, a sculpture that is, uh, you see the reflection in a fun house mirror. And this minimal sculpture is like an anamorphosis because what you see is actually an archetyp archetypical uh, shape that may resemble an alien or a, a fertility uh, Venus or uh, from the ancient ages. Uh, and that forms in, in, in the reflection and like this. And, uh, but the, the, the viewer himself is, and his image in the Fenaz mirror appears completely distorted. Um, I do have to stop the screen oh, sharing. okay. <laughs> I just want to say thank you, Patrick. Thank you. That was very nice. And Zan had to leave. He was, it was midnight where he was from, and I did want to thank him. Sorry, I forgot to do that. I want to move on to our final presenter. Um, we have uh, Tony Silver. Bellarive? Of course. Bellarive. all right. Huh? Doesn't really matter. It's my, it's my weakness. Tony, you thanks me, for being You can call me Tony. Okay, Tony. Um, well, and again, not only do I want to thank you all for staying, participating, and answering questions, asking questions, feel free to reach out with any programming content if you want to share, if you want to share with a friend about what we do, anything at all. Um, and of course, we do accept contributions. It's all visible on our website. And thank you to the, all, all the artists I see who have contributed and continue, continue to contribute. Uh, Tony, where are you coming in from? Tribeca, Manhattan. OK. So I guess I'll have to keep it very brief. Um, so just a quick uh, introduction. First, thank you, Barry, for this invitation. Um, yes, Tribeca, Manhattan the city I love, a uh, quick background. So for 30 years, I was a graphic designer, even though I studied fine arts at the University of the Arts. I loved being a graphic designer. It was fabulous, but I was also 
many ways relieved when I could sell my company and go back to my passion, which is painting. And on my website, there are actually four different areas of work. The aerialscapes, my figurative work, food, and then my silk screens. But tonight, just to make it brief, I will share with you the aerialscapes. So let's try to do this. And here we go. Okay. So now we get the name. Uh, I coined the word aerialscape. I like to say that it's unique, although I've seen many people do images of the world from above. It's been something that I have pursued for about 20 years. And it is seeing the world from above, but making a, a commentary and a statement about it. There are very few people in my world. So let me get started. Manhattan, the country, uh, the city, I'm sorry, the city that I love. And, and I'm very lucky to live here. There is so much to do and see, and I love it all. So many of my paintings are about Manhattan. You can see the graphic design, or I should say graphic designer in my work because it is very graphic. Each piece, even though it's telling a story, it is a compositional piece. And in this particular one, there are endless shapes, sharp edges. And even though I don't usually have people, I like this one because it does have a few. The rooftops where people hang out, the terraces. From below, people just don't see this. But it's fascinating to me living in the city and not knowing who your neighbor is. Most people don't. A unique part of the city, actually I've never seen them anywhere else, are the water tanks. And on top of so many high rise buildings are these water tanks. part of the city, New York City roof pool. Again, no one knows that that pool is sitting up on top of a residential building. When you look over the roof, there is tons of traffic, but again, everything is done with a graphic point of view and for a good reason. I think when I was in art school, things were much more painterly, but because of the design years, this is what I've begun to pursue. A favorite of mine is this Tribeca grid pattern. Oh, it's Tribeca, that's what I call it. Many of my paintings have names which have nothing to do with anything. But the ones in New York, which I haven't shared, I have done some of St. Patrick's, uh, Gates. This one really could be a Google map, which is actually where I got the image. The grid patchwork, however you might want to call it, it's what I wanted to create 
to keep a busyness going on. Oh, you can't see anything, can you? Well, nothing like cutting out the image. So, um, is it better to do this? No. This is working. I see it as it was. Yeah, but it's not the big image I had. Could you see it before? Yes, I could. Maybe just click on it on the left. Maybe. Yeah, okay. So you only see part of the image, so what? Um, this one is very abstract, which is something I'm moving more into, even though you still see lots of shapes and graphic approach, there is still a, um, acknowledgement of reality with the, the windows, the water tower and the cars. Not that anybody would know it's Manhattan. Tony, what abstract artist do you like? What? What abstract artist do you like? Did you say hatchback? Uh, uh, what abstract artist do you like and what hatchback do you drive? <laughs> I don't drive a car, if well, that's what you're asking me. No, but that was one of the questions. The other one was, uh, what artists do you like that are abstract I, or? I think that would take the entire amount that I'm given for this presentation. I'll throw three names at us. I have some in mind myself, but I want to hear yours. Um, and I don't know if they're abstract. I love Alex Cat. I love Devin Korn, but I don't think he's abstract. I love uh, Wayne Tebow, um, but I tend to like figurative artists. Interesting. But let me get back to this. We can, uh, but yeah, of course I like abstract. De Kooning. Pollock. The list is so long. It's just not in my DNA to do abstract. What you saw in the last one that I did um, is, well, I'll show you a few more and you'll see some have gotten more and have been abstract. My website would show a lot. Suburbs, uh, I'm fascinated by suburbs. I'm fascinated by the fact that you don't even have to see people and it tells you so much about the people that live there. Um, in this case, it's um, a, a track housing and um, all the roofs are the same, maybe a few different colors. Somehow to me, it's a blue collar town. No space, backyards, tight. Unfortunately, when I did this Google Slides, I should have put the image on the right and the copy, but I didn't know. So this one is, um, again, graphic. And the back of houses. The shadows help tell you the time of day. And even though I call it Hempstead Backyards, which is in London, it, it really is irrelevant. This is one of my favorites, and I'm sorry you can't see the whole thing. Hempstead wouldn't like you saying that about them. It's quite a posh area of London that's very quaint. I guess like our village a little bit. Yeah. But much, much quieter. Yeah. So some of these I actually work from stock photos or images or whatever. And later on, you'll see something a little different. But um, Tony, in a way, it's like Patrick work, Patrick's work in that you go into these micro details, you're varying them a little, you know, he's varying them a lot in different images, but you've got the repetitive sort of stacking going on, uh, which creates an interesting flattening. And of course you have depth, you've got your angular play. Um, very nice, continue, I'm enjoying it, Tony. Well, this one I particularly like because it really does make a commentary about the American dream and the fact that people want to create the perfect 
house because it's their biggest investment. And look at it. Every single house is the same. Nothing really varies. And I purposely made all the pools turquoise to contrast against the dark houses. Well, again, this is an upscale suburban housing complex. Which I just want to say we are seeing the whole thing when you go large. I don't know oh, why really? you're. Oh, not. I didn't know that. Yeah, we are seeing it. You're, oh, okay. you're making it smaller by going into this other view. Just okay, so you can see it now? Yep. Yep. Oh okay. I see. I can't. <laughs> so I figured what I see, you can't see. Um, the painting is full of color. I am a color person. I love to use a lot of color. When we see my industrial paintings, you'll see they're dark and gloomy. And my reference to things many times have to do with how it attracts me and how I'm trying to share a certain comment about the image and the landscape in this case. I take a totally different point of view in my other work. Uh, Tony, I'd like to read uh, Mitch Pilnick, one of the board members of the ATOA says, uh, Tony, I've always loved your use of color and line. Uh, my favorites are your roadways and they are sort of playful exactly. elements. Yes. You'll see some. <laughs> Again, I'm only showing so few paintings here. And I've tried to divide them into, you know, a couple of areas so that when I show them to you, I can at least talk about that area. I love the suburbs, but I know what Mitch likes. Um, and we'll be coming there. I love this painting because even though it's Hollywood, it is crammed full of houses, all with swimming pools. And again, it's the American dream failing. Hollywood, you would think, would have lots of space, but no, they're packed in there so tight. And I guess it, it's because of the cost of land. That's it. Location, location, location. It's like I live in New York. How many people have a big place to live? I'm impressed by Barbara that she has a huge studio. How nice. Um, when I had my office as a designer, I had a lot of space to work. But now I live in a loft and there isn't that much space. Highways, Mitch. <laughs> so I find it fascinating to see the traffic and highways and roads. This one is pretty abstract. Um, I call it green intersections quartered. It's one of four that I did and they're all different colorways. I think even though I know it's roads, most people may not. Uh, Tony, I have to say, when I see that one, I see how you turn these intersections, you know, into abstract form, but they start to read as leaves or plants and forms like that, organic forms, which you might not associate with roadway, but curves and roadways have to be. Otherwise, uh, you know, we'd have a lot more accidents. Uh, I would like to say, uh, Babs Re Reingold, points out, uh, I very much see the Wayne Thiebaud relationship. Uh, his cityscapes are amazing. And yeah, definitely, uh, you know, uh, you can see that. I like the color and composition of your aerial scapes, Bab says. says. Uh, Alyssa asks, Tony, tell us, how do you get the aerial views previous to paint? I think you mentioned you go for stock photos. Okay. It depends, something like this, obviously, I don't need a stock photo. Um, some of them, and I'll show you what, if I have time for destinations. Um, I actually 
did use stock many times if I'm at the top of a building. Um, but if I use stock, it's never a copy. It's really a starting point. It's a starting point. I usually take it into my computer since I am computer savvy, take it into Photoshop, change the shapes, the images. And then once I feel I have something that I can work from, I go to the canvas because that's what I work on. I work on Scratch Canvas. Um, the paintings are all every, most of them, the smallest, this is I think 30 inches. They go up to six feet by seven feet. Um, but I think if I didn't give this a name, you may or may not know what it is. Is that what you said? Oops, sorry. No, what I said was, I, I like how your, you know, your highway forms go organic and read like leaves, trees, plants, you know, bushes. I like that element there. Of course, it, here it's a little more contrasted with the rectangles and whatnot. But in the last one, it's certainly read leaf-like pattern. So this is one where the only reason it brings you back is that some of these look like they might be houses which they are, but this is really the whole intertwining freeway, whoopway, um, and you don't even see cars. Many of them, if you would go to my website, you would see they have, some of them even have little cars. I like this one. It's a commentary about Dubai and it is really making a statement about the United Arab Emirates oil boom. And so many trees, only they could have afforded to add trees in the roadways, although we have it here, but I like the contrast, which is why I added them. I like the fact that I am designing all this and you can see in here, the little cars. I like that for scale, so I added them. I also like the trees. They give it all some scale. And the design. Uh, Barbara Friedman says, really enjoy the highway loops, Babs Wrangle, nice size for these paintings. That one quickly almost has a look of the Guggenheim in an odd way. And, this one? Yeah, in an odd way, just seeing that oval and it being reduced by the oval inside of it at the bottom. Very nice piece, makes me think of the Russian constructivists around 1920. Yeah. That, uh, um, and this is actually a tower in Macau, China. It exists. This is just the shadow, though. Just a small, small tower. It's actually a pretty big tower. It's a joke. <laughs> it's pretty big. Oh God, the Las Vegas of Asia. But yes, this is uh, my view of all the roadways and highways and everything that surrounds it. All totally abstract. There's nothing real. And I've been having more and more fun with abstracting the work that I do and that it is, um, even though I've given it a name, it really does, it doesn't matter. Industrial, this is what I was saying earlier. Um, we are destroying the world, as we all know. Let's not go into global warming because I don't have to give anybody here a lecture on that. So, Several of my paintings deal with the environment and this one, the oil fields. Now, it's very abstract. It's very expressive. And you don't see that in all my paintings, but I like it for that. I like to get more loose like this. And I think it's because- Tony, it was that, that is a departure for you and I think by opening up the curve and then coloring towards the end 
and lightning off, he gets a similar effect to how Kandinsky gets in his uh, composition yeah. series uh -huh. and things like that, and his improvisations. And that's certainly not easy to achieve. I do like that. And of course, you contrast it with those circles, which will not do that. They'll like hold their space. You want to wrap it up with the last, with the, you want to wrap it up with a few thoughts, Tony? Oh, well, I'm not finished. Okay. So let me just go through these. Again, I don't have to tell you much about this one. It's a coal mine. And again, my statement about how bad coal is. It's dark, it's dingy, there's coal shoots. Another one, dark, but yet, if you can see on the bottom, not painterly, expressive. I like it. Destinations, oh God, my time. Destinations, well, I've been very lucky to travel. And every time I go someplace, I try. And Patrick, you'll like this. My husband's French. So I've been just about everywhere in France. And maybe we, you've even flown into Lyon and seen this airport and train station, which is fascinating from above. And graphically, I was like, oh my God, that is so amazing. I went to India and um, way before what's going on now. I love this, the blue city. I also was in Jaipur, the pink city. This is really about showing architecture and a commentary on how people live. The Pentagon, well, I don't have to tell you too much about this, but the shape alone is so unique. We don't. <laughs> What? No, nothing. Excuse me. Okay. We really don't have many um, buildings that are quite like this. This is a representation of mine in Dusseldorf of the state parliament. It's actually, though, pretty close to the, the building. It's circular, it's dark gray, but I find the fascination, again, with the way it's graphically built environment and, and architecturally it's one of the top landmarks in Germany. A little fantasy, I was in China. I love the little pagoda shapes and um, going to get through this. Everybody wants to leave. This is the last one. So Stermesto, again, an amazing place to visit if you haven't. Um, I've been fortunate enough to go to just about all of Eastern Europe. So if you've been there, you know the architecture is this way. The roofs use these fabulous turquoise, red and magenta colors, which immediately caught my eye. That's it. Let me, uh... Somebody um, somebody asked if, if they were an acrylic. I, I was sort of curious myself. Well, anyway, I'll, I'll tell you, I started out using water-based oil. Ah, and okay. yeah. So it's awful stuff to work with. And then I realized because of the flatness of the picture plane and what I'm doing, I was better off with acrylics. Also living in Manhattan, I have a limited amount of storage space. And some of the ones I did in the water-based really don't store well, but I love acrylics and I've gotten used to using them. I, I know how, and um, I have no problem with it. Of course, oil is different and my figurative, many of those are oil. But again, if you saw my figurative work, and I suggest you go to my website, they're graphic too. Thank you, Tony. Um, 
first of all, thank you, Tony. Very nicely done. Sorry you were cramped for time and went at the end. I'm trying to moderate our time a little bit better. And yes, obviously every artist could prevent for, for an hour and a half and only touch one small part. Our paintings do speak volumes. Go to the Instagram or Facebook, get to know these artists better. And what I found interesting at the end was your interest in the roofs. And then I realized an earlier artist tonight did that. And then I realized, well, didn't Picasso and Brock develop sort of cubism by looking at roofs in the beginning? And it's just funny how sort of a simplicity, uh, sort of archetypal images, are very simple, triangular, square, round, and yet they populated many of the works today in many different ways. There were many interesting crossovers to and differences. You know, thank you everybody for your time. Ari, just one last thing. Is there anything new? Is there anything new? So yes, to make something new, you take <laughs> the things that are old and you put them and together. And then make them, yeah. Yeah, so that's one thing. And then yeah. of course that is new. And the other thing that's new, everything is ephemeral. So everything is new every moment. Exactly. Just, uh, maybe it doesn't look like that. Um, I, I think the artists today, as they always have been here, have been rich. There were a lot of content expressed and a lot to take in. And also, of course, done in our language, our visual language, which is sort of a poet, poetry of line, color, form, but of course, a lot of content, form, and relationship to ideas, philosophy, books, history, <coughs> family history, friends, relationships. Uh, nicely done, everybody. Thank you to all the- so Also, I put my website in yeah. that. I would love for you to look at it. I'd like for you to like me on Facebook, Instagram, and I'll follow you back so we can all share each other's work. Hopefully one day we'll like each other in person. We'll probably be going back in October or in the last quarter of the year to 12 West 12th Street. We'll continue to run these side by side. Um, so if you can come in um, and nothing is finalized yet, but this is what we see happening. You all see it around you. Uh, we seem to be turning a corner out of the pandemic, which we're all grateful for. So thank you to everybody. Share the word. Um, we appreciate you coming. This artist talk on art. Thank you so much. And for all thank you, Barry. Thank and you. thank you, everybody, for giving me this amount of time. You're welcome, Tony. Nice thank you, time. Tony. It was really enjoyable. Have a great evening. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Good, Good night. night. Good night. It was great. Patrick would say, Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Good night. Bonsoir. Thank you. Bonsoir. Brilliant, Patrick. Really brilliant.